What's going on everyone? Uh, thanks for clicking on the video. Um, before we get into the topic of today's video, uh, I just wanted to quickly share with you guys something that I think is really important. Any of you guys who follow me maybe a little bit more closely or maybe you uh, know me personally will know that a side hobby of mine, um, something I like to do in my spare time, is read about philosophy and in particular moral philosophy. One paper that I found to be really influential uh, is one of the most famous papers in this, this area and it's a paper written I think in the late 70s by Peter Singer. And basically in the piece he poses the question or he imagines you to think about a situation where you're walking down the street, say, uh, you're on your way to buy some new clothes or something. And just to the side of the sidewalk, there's a pool or like one of those fountains that has like a pool at the base of it. In the pool, there's a child who's drowning and there are a bunch of other people uh, walking along the sidewalk with you, um, but they're not doing anything. Is it reasonable to jump in the water and save the drowning child, even though you might you know, ruin your outfit uh, and you might not get to go shopping as quickly or whatever? And of course, everyone agrees that yes, the morally correct thing to do in this situation is to jump in and save the child. And then he'll pose the question, does it matter that there are a bunch of other people around, um, but they're not doing anything even though they could? Um, and that doesn't really change the situation, even though there's other people around, you're still ethically obligated, I think, to you still have that moral duty to sort of save the, the child if you can. And then he poses the question of whether or not geographical distancing, so say the child is really far away, um, and you're able to help the child in some other way out of no real harm or even inconvenience to you, are you still morally obligated to help? And most people say yes, you, you should still help if you're able to, you know, if it doesn't do any harm to you. And Singer actually concludes something that is controversial within the philosophical community, that you should donate almost all of your income uh, to people who are in greater need of it. I personally think that if you have the ability to help, then you should. And I think that in light of our current circumstances, I'm sure all of you are aware of Hurricane Harvey. And for me, just being in Florida, this is just across the Gulf in Texas. And uh, oof, it does feel very close to home. And so I would encourage you guys, if you do have the ability to donate, um, then you should. Uh, so there's a link in the description. But yeah, that's my spiel about that. So let's get on to the topic of the video. Let's go. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to be looking at the question of, is there a better time of day to train? So should you train in the morning or the evening? Um, and also, does it matter the order in which you do your cardio and your weight training? So should you do cardio first or weights first? To help us answer this question, I'm going to look at two studies, and they were reviewed in this month's issue of Mass. Uh, Mass is something I've talked about a lot before, uh, but it's basically a research review that I draw heavily on uh, for my Science Explained videos and for these informative videos. Uh, so there were two studies that drew from one data set, and it's a, it's a huge data set, uh, so there's a lot to talk about, um, but I'm going to try to summarize it uh, to the main practical takeaways. So before we dig into it, uh, two really overarching main takeaways uh, that I want to position here at the beginning so that we have context for the <laughs> ensuing conversation. First of all, whether you train in the morning or the evening, or whether you do cardio first or weights first, uh, you can build muscle doing any of those things. So as long as you're weight training and you have sufficient protein in your diet and sufficient calorie intake overall, uh, you'll build muscle um, or you can build muscle. And so these are sort of uh, minutia that can help optimize your training. So these are questions you ask you know, after you have a, a solid training program in place, a solid diet in place that allows you to build muscle from the, from the outset. Second of all, I think that the most important thing should be consistency, actually following through on your plan. Uh, so if you work a job or something that uh, doesn't allow you to get in the gym at a certain time, even though it may be in concept more optimal, uh, you should go with what allows you to get in the gym most consistently, uh, whatever that is and how it lines up with your schedule best. Uh, but with that said, let's dig into what these studies had to say. So this study split 72 subjects. They were aged late 20s and 30s, and they were described as recreationally active. Um, so they had resistance trained before, but they weren't on any dedicated training program over the last year. Um, and they split them into four groups. Two groups trained in the morning and two groups trained in the evening. And within each morning and evening subset, uh, one group would do cardio before training 
and the other group would do weight training before cardio, and then the evening group, you had one group doing cardio first, and the other group doing weights first. Each of the subjects had their chronotypes measured. Uh, so chronotype is basically a measure of circadian rhythm. Uh, so some people have so-called uh, strong eveningness, or in other words, they tend to stay up very late and sleep in a little bit later. Uh, and other people have very strong morningness. So these are like morning people, uh, they tend to go to bed very early, and also wake up very early. Uh, but all of the subjects in this study were not classified as either extreme, and none of them were working like night shifts or on sleep medications or anything like that. So the morning groups trained sometime between 6 and 10.30 a.m., and the evening groups trained sometime between 4.30 and 8 p.m. So you can pause the screen here to get a good idea of what the training setup was like. Uh, but in short, they basically split the whole study into two blocks of 12 weeks. So the first 12 weeks would be considered like a short term duration. Uh, the second 12 weeks was more of like a longer term uh, duration for a 24 week total uh, study length. And then within the first 12 weeks, they ran three blocks back to back to back. And then they repeated those three blocks in the second 12 weeks. The first block was focused on strength endurance. So light weights with high reps and minimal rest between sets. Uh, the second block was more hypertrophy focused. So more moderate loads for about 10 to 15 reps per set. And the final block was strength focused with heavy weights and low reps. And the main exercises that they used to measure strength outcomes across the study were leg press, leg extensions, and leg curls. Uh, but they also did a bunch of upper body stuff like uh, pull downs, uh, presses, and, and so on. Um, the subjects were only training two times per week. And in the first training session, they do low intensity steady state cardio. And then in the second weekly training session, they do high intensity interval training cardio. So they measured a bunch of stuff, uh, but most relevant to us as people interested in maximizing strength and size gains. They used an ultrasound to measure quad uh, muscle cross-sectional area and they used leg press one rep max and maximum isometric knee extension force uh, to assess strength. And so because this study had so many different groups and so many different subcategories, there was a lot of data here. And if you are subscribed to Mass, I definitely recommend reading into the fine print a little bit more uh, as there are some subtleties in there that have important takeaways. Uh, but for here, I'm just gonna outline generalities. One of the most important takeaways from the study was that there was an order effect scene. And this is something that I've emphasized on this channel for a while, uh, but it basically says that if you want to get better at any given quality, then you should do it early in the training session when you're feeling fresh. Uh, so in essence, doing cardio first led to improved measures of endurance and doing weight training first led to improved measures of strength and size. Um, so if your goal is to get better at doing cardio, do your cardio first. Uh, if your goal is to get bigger and stronger, you should do your weight training first. It's worth mentioning in the piece, Greg alludes to some claims that you should do cardio before weight training because since cardio is catabolic, and weight training is anabolic, uh, doing cardio after weight training might dampen that post-workout anabolic signal, um, but I'm not aware of any data uh, supporting this. And honestly, this study supports exactly the opposite of that conclusion. Um, so I think that we should go with the data that we have, and if your goal is to maximize strength and size, then you should prioritize that and do your weight training first. Um, so a little bit of my own added commentary here. Uh, I would like to distinguish between doing cardio before training as like a fat loss tool and then cardio before training as a warm up technique. Uh, so I think that doing some amount of cardio before weight training is a good idea for reducing injury risk and for increasing performance. Um, for me, usually this lasts a minimum of 10 minutes, uh, but I found that even going as high as you know 15 to 25 minutes of low intensity cardio before training doesn't really seem to negatively impact on my performance. So I wouldn't look at that necessarily black and white, like never do any cardio before your training, uh, but just make sure that you keep it low intensity and make sure that the duration doesn't get carried away. I also wouldn't wanna conflate this recommendation with the claim that doing cardio after training is better for fat loss. Um, because even though it may be true that you might burn more fat during that cardio session uh, after weight training, um, that's a narrow, acute focus. And we know that what really matters ultimately for fat loss is 24 hour or longer uh, energy balance. And so what substrate you utilize preferentially during the training session, I think is sort of missing the forest for the trees. Uh, so doing cardio after weight training is a good idea 
primarily for performance reasons and not necessarily for increasing fat burning. I also think that in practice, it might be smart to space your cardio apart from your weight training if you can. Uh, my personal recommendation is try to have at least one meal, or even if it's just a, a carb source, between your weight training and your cardio, uh, so that you can decrease those performance detriments uh, as much as possible and get the most out of both. Uh, but ultimately, my main recommendation for cardio is to do it when it best fits your schedule. And if you do have to do cardio and weight training in the same session, uh, then you should do your cardio after your weight training, and if possible, have a little carb snack or liquid meal or something in between those two. The only time I really probably wouldn't recommend doing cardio is right before training, uh, unless you're using it as a low intensity warm up for the resistance training session itself. Okay, so what about morning versus evening training? Uh, what matters there for hypertrophy? Um, so the main takeaway of the study was that in the first 12 weeks, uh, there was no difference between the morning and the evening groups. Um, however, in the second 12 weeks, uh, there was more, significantly more hypertrophy in those who trained in the evening. And Greg highlights some earlier research, uh, two earlier papers that also support this idea. Uh, more hypertrophy is generally seen in people who train in the evening. So just some of my own commentary here. Uh, I've often heard that you should train in the morning because that's when you can optimize growth hormone output in response to the training. Um, and honestly, I think that manipulating hormones, especially growth hormone within the natural physiological range uh, is really a fool's errand. Um, I talked about this in my, er, in my steroids, uh, in my testosterone science explained video. I think that it'd be much better to structure your training around when you're able to perform the best. And if that's in the morning, then that's okay. Uh, but I think that for most people, uh, given improved or generally improved hydration status, uh, more of a fed state, perhaps more glycogen, training performance is probably better for most in the evening. Uh, with that said, um, I've coached a lot of people who say work long day jobs or maybe they're students and after that long work day or school day, they're more tired in the evening and so they find that they can perform better in the morning and a lot of this can have to do with chronotype as well. So if you are someone who has say strong morningness, uh, then perhaps you should ignore this data and go with what is working best for you or you found to historically work better for you. However, assuming none of those things are in place, uh, and you can train according to a flexible schedule, uh, we do have some accumulating evidence now that training in the afternoon or evening uh, is slightly better for maximizing hypertrophy. And the authors of this study didn't really speculate too much on why that may be the case, uh, but I would hypothesize that it's probably mostly due to performance improvements, um, the fact that you're just better fed, more glycogen, more hydration, uh, you feel more awake, uh, that sort of thing. But again, that will be uh, highly individual. Um, so that's it for this one, guys. I uh, hope that you liked the video. Uh, please make an effort to donate to the Hurricane Harvey Relief Fund or any other charity that you trust. And just remember that geographical distancing or the presence of others who may be or may not be helping, uh, I don't think is a valid excuse to not help if you can. Um, and of course, every bit uh, does help. Also, I've got more information about MASS linked in the description. Uh, so if you'd like to check that out, I think that MASS does a really good job of citing a lot of research that has a lot of application. And it certainly covers a lot more than I can do on this channel. And if you do sign up, you get access to all of the back dated issues. Um, so as of now, I think there are six issues that are out and there's just a ton of material in there, uh, not just reading material, they also do uh, videos and audio. So if you don't have the time to read, you can listen to it on the go. Um, so yeah, this is a really, really great resource to anyone who has an interest in the science behind uh, building strength, gaining muscle, uh, being healthier, all that kind of stuff. Um, thanks again, guys, so much for watching. And I've got another Science Explained video on the way this week. I'm hoping for a Wednesday upload, uh, so you can stay tuned for that. And I will see you guys then.